Bonsoir, mesdames et messieurs. Uh, welcome. Democracy, nonviolent struggles for recognition. Hi, I'm Kevin Page. I'm the president and CEO of the Institute of Fiscal Studies and Democracy, the University of Ottawa. So we at, at this institute, the Institute of the IFSD, and our colleagues in the campaign of Ivo Javat are delighted to host this very special discussion on nonviolent struggles for representation and rights in celebration of the 150th anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi's birth. So we're looking forward to an engaging conversation among our distinguished panelists, and you must, you, as you will, they will be introduced, it's an incredible panel, and our moderator, I'll introduce briefly uh, in a minute, on the issues of rights and representation and the expression of democracy. So a special thanks to the Mahatma Gandhi Peace Council of Ottawa for their collaboration and support this evening. And of course, we are grateful to our partners at CPAC for their continued support and coverage of our events. So I'm pleased to invite the president of the University of Ottawa, Mr. Jacques Fremont, who himself is closely connected to matters of democracy and human rights, to offer some words of welcome. Thank you. Merci, Kevin. Monsieur le Haut Commissaire Schwarup, Madame Cefolo, Ministre Pénipotentiaire, Monsieur Lowers, Premier Secrétaire, Honorable Erwin Cutler, Sous-ministre Ibrahim, Madame Blackstock, Professeur Gandhi, professeurs et collègues, Mesdames et Messieurs. En tant que recteur et président de l'Université d'Ottawa, Je suis particulièrement heureux de vous accueillir ce soir. I would like to welcome each and every of you to this evening's event, during which we will explore a certain meaning of democracy. Specifically, our focus will be on how nonviolent struggles for political representation by marginalized or oppressed communities have transformed democracies in the past and how they can continue to effectively transform democracies Today, whenever we gather for an important event like this, it is our custom to begin by offering an indigenous affirmation in support of reconciliation. Nous rendons hommage au peuple algonquin, gardien traditionnel de cette terre. Nous reconnaissons le lien sacré de longue date l'unissant à ce territoire qui demeure non cédé. Nous rendons également hommage à tous les peuples autochtones qui habitent Ottawa, qu'ils soient de la région <coughs> ou d'ailleurs au Canada. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leaders, past, present, and future. I am here tonight in my official capacity, of course, as president of the University of Ottawa, but this is also a topic that is of great interest to me personally. In fact, immediately prior to taking up position at the University of Ottawa, I had the honor, and sometimes a difficult duty, of serving as the Quebec president of the Quebec's Human Rights Commission. A large part of my job there was to represent an advocate for victims of discrimination and marginalized communities and marginalized communities are not far from us, even here in Canada and everywhere, in every city in Canada, in every province in Canada, not without saying outside the cities and everywhere in the country. And I can tell you this was not always easy to chair the Quebec Human Rights Commission because my advocacy was not always desired or welcome. In fact, it was very rarely welcomed. Uh, but it is a, a fact of life, and it was important to do that work. C'était un travail dont j'étais fier, tout comme je suis fier aujourd'hui de travailler à l'Université d'Ottawa, où nous aussi, par des événements comme celui-ci, par nos recherches, nos programmes, nous travaillons à renforcer la démocratie en ouvrant les esprits, en créant des ponts entre les communautés et les cultures, et en formant les leaders De demain. Democracies are never perfect. By their very nature, they promote diversity of thought and action and will therefore always be vulnerable to sabotage and subversion. I think right now, to be honest, 
democracies are victim of hate speech, and when we say hate, it means violence under a different disguise. And, and we have to reflect collectively. When anti-democratic forces gain momentum, as they seem to be doing in many countries today, democracy is definitely weakened. And unfortunately, as we know, democracy can eventually become too weak and can collapse. But a democracy can never be too strong, at least real democracy can never be too strong. The more rigorously and inclusively we enact essential democratic principles, the healthier our democratic system will become. Tonight, the angle which you will discuss is original as far as I'm, I'm concerned, and it's a forgotten angle in our democratic debate now. It's too often forgotten, and I thank you in advance uh, for the thoughts you will share uh, to remind us that there are all sorts of ways to support a democracy. So thank you very, very much uh, in advance for that lesson. So I also take the democratic principle as being paramount importance to our highly respected panelists tonight. I wish there were more students in the room to listen what they will say, but I do hope that they will watch CPAC late at night or early in the morning. Uh, so it is, uh, thank you for being here and thank you for the distinguished career uh, you have led. And thank you also to our moderator and for the formidable work Kevin is doing. I look forward to hear from all of you and this is going to be an exciting evening. Thank you very much and again, welcome to the University of Ottawa. Thank you, Mr. Fima. So it's my pleasure to invite the High Commissioner of India to Canada, uh, Mr. Vikas Swarup, to the stage. Bonsoir and good evening. Mr. Jacques Fremont, President of Ottawa University, Dr. Kevin Page, Professor Irvin Kotler, distinguished guests. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor for me as the High Commissioner of India to join you all this, uh, this evening for this seminar on democracy, nonviolent struggles for recognition. As we meet here, the world's biggest festival of democracy is unfolding in India, where 900 million people are voting in 1,030,000 polling stations across the country using 2.33 million electronic voting machines to choose the representatives to the 17th Lok Sabha. The elections are being supervised by 12 million electoral and security officials, almost one third the population of Canada. If Indians have this privilege of being the world's largest <coughs> democracy, then it is in large measure because of the contribution of one man Mahatma Gandhi, who led the non-violent struggle against British colonialism and won us our independence. In this post-truth world that we are inhabiting today, where violence and ethnic conflict is on the rise, where narrow domestic walls are being constructed to keep the other out, I think Mahatma Gandhi's message of peace, truth, harmony, reconciliation rings even more loudly than it was during his time. And I am delighted that the panel that has gathered here today is probably the finest panel in the world. Because there are two kinds of people. They are preachers, those who preach a message, and they are practitioners. Tonight, we have three practitioners. Dr. Raj Mohan Gandhi, Dr. Ibrahim Ibrahim, whom I used to know. My own was in South Africa and of course, Dr. Cindy Blackstock. So like all of you, I am eagerly looking forward to hear the message that they give us, a message which I think can provide a light during our dark times. Thank you. <clears throat> a 
And now I'm pleased to invite Mrs. Gupta, President of the Mahatma Gandhi Peace Council of Ottawa, to the stage. I feel greatly privileged to be here on behalf of Mahatma Gandhi Peace Council. And Mahatma Gandhi, feel, uh, Mahatma Gandhi Peace Council feels really honored to have such highly distinguished guests, panelists, and jurors. So I, I can't really have words to really further explain. I think uh, the guests are already welcome here. I just wanted to say that this is the 150th birth anniversary year of Mahatma Gandhi. And MGPC has planned to celebrate the year by hosting and partnering a series of events to promote Gandhiji's principles and teachings in collaboration with other institutes and organizations. Today's event is the first of this series. And thanks a million to the Institute of Physical Studies and Democracy at the University of Ottawa for partnering with us. We live in a dynamic world, but it is not an unalterable one. This is the way I see it. Society exists in a certain way today, but it is our actions or our inactions that determine the evolution of the society and the social fabric. There must be a better way and non-violent tools to deal with the problems of increasing unresponsiveness and self-centeredness. Let us hear our honored great panelists today. So thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. OK, so now it's, um, thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Gupta. So now it's the, my privilege to introduce our distinguished moderator for this evening, one of my heroes, Erwin Kotler, chair of the Ra Ra Raul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights at McGill University and a former Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada, Mr. Cutler, I now turn things over to you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. When uh, I was a parliamentarian, you were a, a beacon of light uh, for all of us and demonstrating what transparency and accountability is all about and hoping to shine the spotlight uh, on <coughs> democracy and that accountability uh, within it. So <coughs> we are in your debt. Those of us from whatever party we happen to represent uh, during your tenure at the time. <coughs> to uh, Jacques uh, Fremont, I can only say I was one of the beneficiaries as a coming in Quebecois uh, of, of your tenure as the head of the uh, Quebec uh, Human Rights uh, Commission. Uh, nous étions fiers uh, de votre engagement et de votre leadership. Et merci, Jacques, pour cette <laughs> And <coughs> High Commissioner, representatives from at McGandy Sasai, we, uh, you have inspired us. We come together really at an important moment uh, of remembrance and, and reminder on the occasion of the 150th anniversary of the birth of Mahatma Gandhi, which is taking place at a time uh, that we have a democratic festival in India, uh, as you put it, and where uh, South Africa has just concluded its uh, elections, when one thinks the long road of apartheid uh, to now get another heroic uh, struggle, and of course, uh, indigenous people uh, who are struggling here in, in Canada for their proper uh, representation uh, in the Canadian democratic polity. So I'm, I, I'm delighted uh, to welcome you to this Forum on, on Democracy, uh, really featuring an, the non-violent struggles for recognition, as I have mentioned, and the techniques used to achieve democratization and the lessons to be learned uh, from it. And in particular, uh, the heroes who have waged this battle, who are our panelists this evening. This forum as I mentioned,
comes together at an important moment of remembrance and reminder, but could not have come at a more uh, propitious time in the struggles for democracy. About two years ago, a group of human rights activists, uh, scholars, uh, public intellectuals, gathered together to sign the Prague Declaration for Democratic Renewal, whose theme was, and I quote, liberal democracy is under threat and all who cherish it must come to its defense. Since then, <clears throat> these threats have not only not abated, but have intensified. They include, and they were referenced in the Prague Declaration at the time, but as I said, they have actually worsened since then, a growing resurgent authoritarianism, which is not only suppressing its own people at home, but indeed threatening democracies and democracy abroad. An authoritarian disinformation, the weaponization of social media, which is further undermining democracies, democratic institutions, and democratic uh, values. The volatility of transition from democracies to, in fact, authoritarian countries. We see this in the case of Venezuela, in the case of Turkey. The threats to democracy from within, as witnessed in the illiberal, <coughs> illiberalism on the rise in Hungary, the Philippines, and other backsliding uh, democracies. And in other countries, even long established democracies support for democracy, for its institutions, for its values, is increasingly eroded as democracies themselves face new challenges and increasing challenges of globalization, inequality, and anti-immigrant ethos, xenophobia, hate speech, as uh, Jacques has mentioned. Political processes that appear increasingly to be sclerotic and dysfunctional. Terrorist violence that creates a climate of fear used by despots and demagogues to justify further restrictions on freedoms. All of it coming together, and I'll use the closing words of the Prague Declaration, which said, quote, collectively, these factors, the geopolitical retreat of the West, the resurgence of author authoritarian political forces, the erosion of belief in democratic values, and the loss of faith in the efficacy of democratic institutions have brought a historic halt to democratic progress and threaten a possible reverse wave, as they put it, of democratic breakdowns. Democracy supporters, as they put it, must unite to halt the retreat and to organize a new coalition for its moral, intellectual, and political renewal. Fortunately, we have this evening with us, as I mentioned, a group of indomitable warriors for democracy who have come together and who have led the struggle for nonviolent movements in South Africa, in India, and in Canada. Movements that have sought not only to bring about democracy, as in the case of South Africa, or to give democratic protection to its indigenous founders, as in the case of Canada, but to realize democracy for its people, as in the case of India. And in respect of each, different tools, different uh, resources have been used in that democratic, nonviolent struggle. Our three panelists uh, this evening are Dr. Cindy Blackstock, the Executive Director of the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society, herself a member of the Gitzgan First Nation, a professor of social work at McGill University, and an internationally recognized authority on indigenous issues. And I'm delighted not only to welcome you here, uh, Cindy, but you have been a, as you have been described as Canada's relentless moral voice for First Nations equality. Ibrahim Ibrahim has 
dedicated his life to political activism and advocacy. He was at the forefront of the anti-apartheid movement and was a political prisoner in South Africa for 15 years. He was together with Nelson Mandela on Robben Island. I might tell you, uh, Ibrahim, that uh, we recently, I say we in Canada, uh, last <coughs> November, uh, inaugurated the Nelson Mandela Lectureship in Human Rights uh, in remembrance and in tribute uh, to Nelson Mandela, who demonstrated how one person could endure 27 years in a South African prison and yet emerge to preside over and lead us into a democratic, non-racial, egalitarian South Africa. And you were an important part of that struggle, Ibrahim. You went on uh, to become uh, the Deputy Foreign Minister of South Africa, which is in the capacity that I I met you there, chair of the Foreign Relations Committee, be a member of parliament, and we welcome you uh, here and look forward to your insights as well this evening. And Professor Rajmohan Gandhi is a distinguished professor at the University of Illinois Center for South Asian and Middle Eastern Studies. He recently completed a mammoth work uh, on a study uh, of <coughs> South Asia, and through his involvement uh, with Initiatives for Change, Dr. Gandhi dedicated really over a half a century of his life towards the struggle for reconciliation, democracy, trust building, and the like. And the important battle, which is at this point undermining uh, democracies today, and that is the struggle against corruption and uh, inequality. If I may say parenthetically, and I hope not uh, presumptively, Professor Gandhi, when I was a child growing up, as my parents of blessed memory w would tell you, uh, they nicknamed me Mahatma Gandhi. That's what I was called the first years of uh, my life. Uh, before I understood the greatness of Mahatma Gandhi, the reason because I was a, a very skinny, uh, little boy who was always talking about peace. <laughs> and so they named me Mahatma Gandhi. And as I grew older, I realized, you know, that that was the most important accolade that anyone could ever have given me. So we welcome you here this evening amongst us. So may I, in the first round of questions, and I'll be joining you uh, after I put the question uh, to you, to each of you, to, if you can, to share briefly the essence of your struggle. In other words, what strategies, what resources did you call upon to seek to achieve your democratic goals? And if we could begin with uh, you, Cindy, and we'll just go in turn. Well, first of all, it's a great honor to be here on the lands of the Algonquin people, the unceded lands of the Algonquin people. I think I thought about the struggle I was involved in the wrong way at first. You see, since Confederation, Canada has had a colonial DNA. As Robert Williams, the Native American scholar said, at the bedrock of colonialism is a savage and civilized dichotomy. And it was that dichotomy that allowed successive federal governments to provide less funding for public services for First Nations children than all other Canadians received, and to build a narrative amongst the Canadian population that we were getting more than everybody else, not less. The result for these children was what you could imagine. They didn't know that somebody in Ottawa was making a decision that they weren't worth the money. They just knew that life was a lot harder for them. And so they started to believe that they're not worth the money, that there's something in them that was wrong. And this had been going on since Confederation. It had been going on despite the federal government having routine solutions and brought to their attention. And that's kind of where I stumbled into the picture, on the heels of many people who had gone before me 
and many people who were then involved in that struggle of trying to awaken the Canadian consciousness so that we would see that we are using racism as fiscal policy in this country. I came at a time when I had witnessed the great struggle in South Africa. And I had learned of the traditions of Gandhi. And I had also learned from my own elders, and I knew one thing for sure, is you cannot defeat discrimination, you cannot defeat colonialism, on a basis of tears and anger. It is only love that creates a platform for a sustainable movement. You must love the colonialism out of them. And a little bit of court helps too. <laughs> so after going through, working with my colleagues on successive solutions and seeing that government's reaction was the same, we do the work, they wouldn't implement the solution, they would say we need another report. And meanwhile, children's childhoods were going at the wayside. In 2007, we filed a human rights complaint against the government of Canada, alleging that this type of underfunding, particularly of children's services, was driving children into state care at higher rates than a residential school. Within 30 days, our organization got our federal funding cut. By the time the final arguments were heard in 2014, the Canadian government was found responsible for having breached the law on three occasions. It had brought eight motions to dismiss the complaint on legal technicalities. It did not want the Canadian public to know the truth. And that was that we were in this moment, this time, using racial discrimination against 165,000 children. The reason, though, that the decision actually came in the children's favor in 2016, I think was not so much even in the matter of the facts of the case, although they were very strong. I think the real hope of this case was when children started coming to the courtroom. You see, we created this campaign called I Am a Witness to invite people to come and watch. Don't take a side in the case. Just watch and then decide for yourself whether you think this is an okay thing for in this country for this to exist. Very few adults ever came. But that changed in 2009 when a group of high school students showed up. One young man told me, we're from alternative school, which means we get into trouble a lot. And I said, good, so do I. <laughs> and I said, sometimes we deserve it. But sometimes it's the system that deserves it and no one ever takes them on. So not only did they come to the hearings, the next time they were wearing t-shirts, and by 2012, there were so many children of all diversities in the courtroom that we had to book them in and show. The children of Canadians could see that this racism could not be excused on any grounds, when the adults were still normalizing it. And for me, that is gonna be the real victory. When those children grow up, and they will not elect anyone of any political stripe into the Canadian legislature, if as part of their mandate, they are gonna normalize the racial discrimination against children. And the children have taught me something fundamental about activism. And that is that you just have to do something. It's not enough to care. We cannot leave the lives of our children in the hands of a government. We must, as a people, if we truly care about equality and fairness and what we think is just in Canada, embrace those actions in ourselves and take action. If a little child can write a letter to the Prime Minister, then an adult should be able to sing in a relentless chorus until the government puts the tools of discrimination down. And we finally, in this country, raise a generation of First Nations kids who never have to recover from their childhoods. I'll now turn it over to Ibrahim Ibrahim. You, as I mentioned, were political prisoners. South Africa was not only a racist philosophy, it was a racist legal regime. It was the only post-World War II country that institutionalized racism as a matter of law. And so you had to transition from that apartheid to a democracy. How did you engage in that struggle uh, against the apartheid regime? What 
tools, what resources did you use to leverage it? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation to address you this evening. Uh, when we look at Mahatma Gandhi, we do show <clears throat> from the South African perspective. Uh, I think, Rajmohan, you've heard this before. We always say that you gave us Mohamdas Karamchand Gandhi, and then we gave you back Mahatma Gandhi. Because we came to South Africa, and he experienced the humility, the discrimination, the abuse uh, by this then South African government. More South Africa, British government against uh, his own people. And of course, being a lawyer, he took up a number of cases. And he formed the first political organization in South Africa, the Natal Indian Congress in 19, uh, 1894. The president was uh, Abdul Haji Adam. And Gandhi was the honorary secretary of that organization. His idea of uh, nonviolent struggle developed in his struggle in South Africa against the South African government. People say it's passive resistance. It, it, it was more than that. It was, it was spiritual, uh, uh, and, and it was communal. And he was able to, to say that he was able to organize the people to resist the unjust laws. By going into prison, he became a type of a moral force in South Africa. How did that affect now our own struggle? Now? I read the other day that uh, Gopal Krishna Gokul, who came to South Africa in 1912, invited by Mahatma Gandhi. And Mahatma Gandhi arranged for him to meet the president of the African National Congress, John Dube. And Dube writes that he said he was very impressed the way Gandhi led the Indian community against unjust laws without using any violence. He became a moral force that the, that, the, that the government then, the authorities had to take uh, uh, cognizance of, they had to recognize uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the unjust that was great, that was happening to the Indian people. So in our struggle, uh, the Gandhian philosophy, I think, played a very important role in throughout our struggle. Many of our leaders, including Nelson Mandela, was very much uh, very much uh, uh, influenced by the Gandhian philosophy. Last year, we celebrated 100 years of, of Nelson Mandela. If you find that in all of our struggle, the question of nonviolence was the central theme coming from the Gandhian struggle of, of, of nonviolence. Uh, in the 50s, for instance, we, we, we we had what was called, we adopted what was called the Freedom Charter, what South Africa should lo look like. And the first sentence was, South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white. It laid the foundation of a non-racial and a democratic South Africa. When we, in 1960, when our organization was banned, we did decide at that stage to form an armed wing. I was part of it, and our instruction was quite clear. You are not to take civilian lives. And our president, Oliver Tambo, signed the Geneva Convention. I'm not sure how many liberation movement did that. Signed the Geneva Convention that we are going to conduct our armed action in terms of the Geneva Convention. There's no kidnapping, there's no suicide bombing, et cetera, et cetera. So the point I'm trying to make that when we negotiated for a democratic South Africa, the Gandhian thinking 
was very, very predominant in the leadership of the African National Congress and the leadership of people who belong to the, the Natal Indian Congress, for instance, and even in the African National Congress, you see. Uh, we're very close at that time uh, with the Indian government. There was a close relationship between the African National Congress and the Indian National Congress, for instance. There was close relation. So when we establish a democratic South Africa, I think we are the most democratic country in the, in, on the continent. Uh, with strong human rights foundation, a constitution that, uh, th that places emphasis on human rights with a strong bill of rights, with the independent judiciary, the independent media, and, 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 uh, and a diversity, which I think comes from the Gandhian philosophy, that there was unity in diversity in South Africa. So when we say that how we reached to that point, Part of our history come from the activities and the experience of Mahatma Gandhi in the early part of the 19th century. Thank you. Thank you, Reem. We'll now turn it over to the scholar of uh, Mahatma Gandhi himself, Professor Gandhi, who will enlighten us as well how that non-violent approach of Mahatma Gandhi, how that led to democratization uh, in India. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, but before I answer your question, uh, may I say that as a journalist that I've been for 50, 60 years, as an observer of the world, as a professor, as a historian, uh, my conclusion today about today's world is that if there is one country in today's world that can give a lead to the world in preserving democracy, it is Canada. So allow me to say that. Um, there are many countries with diversity. Uh, India is one. United States is one, so many others, and Canada is one. But Canada has diversity plus a commitment to equal rights for all, plus a commitment to liberty. So diversity plus equality plus liberty. What a phenomenal combination Canada has, at least in theory, and so often also in practice. So I wanted to first give my observation uh, my assessment as a student of the world on how Gandhi uh, helped bring India both to political independence and to democracy. Here are two or three uh, appraisals of mine. Uh, he had three uh, broad principles that he taught so many Indians. They were not always obeyed, but they were something like this. I'm, I'm, this is my paraphrasing of Gandhi's approach. One was hate not. The other was fear not. And the third was see, recognize the unseeable, the forgotten, the weakest. Hate not, fear not, and do not be blind to the weak and the vulnerable. Now, one example of how India entered liberty and its early years as a free nation was the nature of the first Indian cabinet. Jawaharlal Nehru was the prime minister. Uh, the great Vallabhai Patel was the deputy prime minister. The, this cabinet had 14 members. Seven of these 14 members, the Indian National Congress, the vehicle for the Indian independence movement. And we all know that India, from 1947, was 80% Hindu. 
But this cabinet of 14 had two Muslims. It had two Christians. It had one Zoroastrian. It had two leaders of the former untouchables, as they were called, the great Bhimrao Ambedkar and Babu Jagjeevan Ram. Uh, sadly, it had only one woman, but it, there was at least one woman, a Christian woman, Rajkumari Amrit Kaur. So the attempt was made at this foundation of our independence, thanks to Gandhi and his great colleagues, uh, to show diversity even at the highest levels of the Indian government. And the next measure of Gandhi's approach, and you might say Gandhi's accomplishment, was also the incredible constitution that was created. And the architect of that constitution was Dr. Baba Sahib Bhimrao Ambedkar, the leader of the Dalits. So the leader of a community that for a couple of thousand or more years had been ostracized and persecuted and ill-treated in an absolutely indescribable manner, the leader of that community is requested by the Indian leadership to preside over the creation of the Indian constitution. And he did. He was a great lawyer. He came to the United States also to study. Uh, and he led the debates in parliament, uh, in the constituent assembly, that led to the creation of the Indian constitution, which guaranteed that India was a land for all who live in it. It was not going to be a land only for the Hindus, although the Hindus were the majority. It was going to be a land for everybody, and equal rights, equality, were entrenched into the Indian constitution. Um, something else about Gandhi's approach I might mention here. In 1940, his weekly newspaper was banned. So Gandhi then said, okay, we will deal with this. And I want every Indian to become a walking newspaper. 1940. And he, said, and he said that there are only two or three tests that you have to pass before you become a walking newspaper. First, be sure of what news you are passing to your neighbor. And he said that if individual citizens pass on news from one mouth to the, uh, to the next mouth, third mouth, it would reach everybody. But be sure that what you are passing on is absolutely reliable. Uh, do not exaggerate. Uh, do not pass on anything that is dishonest. And if you do this, then no censorship, no ban on freedom of speech will prevent the people from getting to know what has happened. This was the beginning of social media <laughs> in 1940. You can imagine Gandhi tweeting messages, <laughs> but he wanted the people of India to tweet messages one to the other. Um, so I wish I could say, our wonderful High Commissioner, and by the way, what he has done with his writing to bring the vulnerable, vulnerable people of India to the fore has not been done by most people, so I, I salute his role. But I wish I could say, and I'm, I must of course speak absolutely truthfully, even more truthfully when our High, when our High Commissioner is present. <laughs> I wish I could say that today in India, we really have democracy on the ground. Because what has been mentioned by all of you, hate speech, has become so normal in India today. And so people are being pressurized, not necessarily by the government, but they are pressurized by organized groups of people, sometimes organized mobs. And I'm ashamed to admit, but it's not a secret, and you all know that even lynchings have taken place. And vulnerable, vulnerable people have been done away with because of the hatred 
and, and, and the willingness to dominate and coerce. <clears throat> uh, Gandhi said several times before he was killed in January 1948, a few months after independence, Gandhi said that I want freedom of India, but also I want the freedom of the individual Indian. There was a wonderful slogan in India at that time, popularized by Subhash Chandra Bose, a great figure that many have heard of, a remarkable man. And this phrase was Jai Hind. Jai means victory, and Hind was a name for India. There was a demonstration, and some, this is before, well before independence, two, three years before independence, and some Indians eager for, for independence were asking fellow Indians to say Jai Hind, Jai Hind. And when some people were reluctant to say Jai Hind, they were beaten up. So Gandhi said, Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If any individual in India is forced to make any kind of shout, any kind of patriotic slogan, that that is the end of independence. And I'm afraid today, in 2019, recent years, so many groups of people in different parts of India have been compelling people to shout particular slogans. And the other day, in an election rally, one member of the Indian government, who is himself running for office, said something like this. There's another wonderful slogan, but this has a religious connotation. It's a very moving slogan, a patriotic slogan, but it has a religious con connotation. And so not everyone is enthusiastic about shouting it. It says, Vande Mataram, I bow to thee, Mother India. And many people are deeply stirred by it, but because of its religious connotation, some people are cautious about it. But this but particular, particular member of parliament said in a speech, referring to the Muslim community of India, if you're not willing to say Vande Mataram, there may be problems for you. He said, I am a Hindu. When I die, and my people we don't need any land for our barrier. But you guys, you need a few feet of land. But if you don't say Vande Mataram, you may not get those few feet of land. So this is what is happening in today's India. So as you rightly say, I am not a leader of any kind of movement, but I am a student of this movement, and of course I believe in fear not, hate not, and see the invisible and the marginalized. So it is, it is part of my duty also uh, to speak out as and when I can. Thank you, sir. <laughs> And, and, and thank you, Professor Gandhi. I, I'd like to ask each of you to uh, reflect for a moment uh, on the movement uh, that you've led uh, and ask yourself, how do you feel about things as they are now? Are you pleased with the progress that has been made? Um, are there certain dynamics or matters threatening uh, the objectives of your movement, what are the main challenges, in effect, that you are facing now? Uh, these are some of the cluster of questions that I just ask you to uh, consider in whatever way you wish, but mainly to just reflect on uh, the movement that you've led, uh, the success that it's had, and where do we go from here? We'll start again with you, Cindy. Well, I think the greatest victory is actually the thousands of children who are now standing with First Nations children to really call for justice and an end to this discrimination. They are from all walks of daycare and all walks of school and youth groups and all of them realize it doesn't take any money to make the world a better place. It just takes standing together to end discrimination in all of its forms. Just last Friday, it was Bear Witness Day, to honor Jordan River Anderson, the founder of Jordan's Principal. And children all across Canada brought their teddy bears to daycare and to school to honor Jordan.
to remember him and his sacrifice because he was a First Nations little boy who never left the hospital because of his racial status because governments fought over who should pay. But the teddy bear recognized more than that. It was their commitment to not allow that to continue to happen to any child in this country. And it was a symbol of their own efficacy as children in being able to shape a Canada that the adults have been unable to realize for on their behalf. That to me is the greatest benefit. Of course, thanks to the, the now eight orders, we've had seven non-compliance orders since the original order in 2016. The Canadian government is beginning to comply. And this past year alone, over 250,000 services and products have gone out to First Nations children in Jordan's name that wouldn't have otherwise been provided. And we're having a conversation in this country about child welfare. But I think the missing ingredient is really why governments aren't doing better in child welfare when they know better. Why are we um, you know, not addressing the water shortages, the addiction services inequities, the mental health inequities that drive child welfare? Um, we can change legislation, we can uh, tinker around on the edges, but until we get to the core of that substance, the very kind of the DNA piece around our normalization of the discrimination, and our refusal to accept that First Nations do have solutions to be able to care for their own children, <coughs> then the progress we make will be marginal. I think I've learned one important lesson, and it was really thanks to uh, the maintenance man outside of Gandhi's uh, museum in Delhi. I had spent so much time trying to talk to the government to try and get them to do the right thing. And I would continue to talk to the government and continue to do studies and try and do a better study. And I went to see the, I was in Gandhi's museum and I, I'm one of the type A people who sees the five top highlights and go out the door and spend most of my time in a gift shop. But I was with somebody who's much more meticulous, so I had to wait. But I was outside and the maintenance guy was having a cigarette, uh, smoking a cigarette and asked me what I did. And I told him all the trials of trying to get Canada um, to address these situations and trying to get them to understand the human crises that they were putting in place, indeed the deaths of children, the losses of childhood, and how we study it again and we get them to agree and they do it. And finally I ran out of breath, I think much to his relief. <laughs> and he said, let me get this straight. You talk to them, you work with them, they agree with the problem, they agree with the solution, they do nothing, and you do exactly the same thing over again. He said, didn't you learn anything in that house? He says, your conversation needs to be with the Canadian people, not with the government. Governments don't uh, create change, they respond to change. And that was a turning point and something I'm trying to get better at that conversation as I go. But now I have thousands and thousands of little people who are mentoring me along on that trail and I feel absolutely blessed. I, I, I have to say, Cindy, as I hear you talking about uh, children's rights, I, I remember something uh, my daughter taught me when she was 15 years of age. She's now about to become 40. It was the most important human rights lesson that I was ever taught. And she said to me, Daddy, if you want to know what the real test of human rights is, always ask yourself at any time, in any situation, in any part of the world, is what is happening good for children? Is it good for children, Daddy? That's the real test of human rights. It's something I never forgot, and you've illustrated it uh, so dramatically for us now. Ibrahim? Thank you very much. Uh, of course, South Africa, uh, as I said, was a, was a democratic state. It was a constitutional state uh, with a very, very strong civil society with a very independent constitutional court and uh, with, with uh, other organs of state <coughs> that protects human rights. Uh, we, we, pa we passed legislation now against hate speech. We did experience now and again this hate speech. You do have a shift to the right some shift to the right, uh, especially people who, who are hankering over the old apartheid system. You have populism now that is growing to the left. 
And uh, the problem is with the economy of the country, because if the economy doesn't grow, and with a high unemployment rate of 27%, you do find some type of tensions developing. Uh, why would uh, <coughs> uh, a person of Indian origin should get a job, but uh, not, an, yes, not an African, that type of thing? But I don't think it's an issue that is, uh, that, that is a much concern. It's a very serious issue. Social cohesion, I think, is holding in, in, in South Africa. And, uh, and uh, with, other than the economic problems, you have examples of hate speech, which the law enforcement agents had taken action against them. There was one white lady now who was sentenced, I think, to 18 months uh, because she said something derogatory against the blacks. So the system is holding, and, 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 and I think that, uh, mind you, we have 11 official languages there, because we have nine ethnic groups. Uh, then we have uh, four main racial groups. Not to hold them together in one country, in, in, in a democratic system, I think it has been an achievement. And, uh, and uh, <coughs> There has been some uh, problems in government, in the institution, which I think our president, we just had an election, which is uh, on his way to, uh, to address. Thanks, thanks. I, I think South Africa is one of the most comprehensive, not compelling, bills of rights in the world, and I have to say that uh, your jurisprudence on freedom of expression and, and hate speech is actually a model, and one that many uh, democracies uh, can draw upon in terms of not only protecting freedom of expression as a fundamental freedom, but also recognizing when uh, hate speech has crossed the line. So uh, your country in that as well has been uh, a model. Professor Gandhi, your reflections? Um, well, I already mentioned something, you know, in my earlier remarks, but I, I'll say this. Uh, despite some very troubling things that are happening in Indian, Indian society today, in Indian polity, in the Indian nation, of course, everybody knows that India has made gigantic strides, tremendous strides in so many areas, uh, which gives us very great uh, pride. Um, when uh, Gandhi was still living, a remarkable African-American scholar called William Stuart Nelson from Harvard University in Washington, D.C., was in India, and he spoke with Gandhi. And he said, you have been preaching nonviolence to India for 30 years, but why has so much violence taken place? Because at that was the time when Hindu-Muslim killings, very sadly, had disfigured so many parts of the subcontinent. So Gandhi thought for a while, and then he said something, and here again I'm paraphrasing, these are not his exact words, but something like this. He said, I've been asking Indians for such a long time to fear not and hate not. They loved and followed the first lesson, they were not so keen on the second lesson. <laughs> um, and Gandhi said that the hatred of the white man can easily get transformed into hatred of your fellow Indian. Uh, hatred of the Hindu in the Muslim, the hatred of the Muslim in the Hindu, and so forth. I think uh, that is something to, to keep in mind. Uh, really, that, uh, as I think has been mentioned, uh, if violence is to be tackled, hate has to be tackled. It has to be tackled in the home, it's to be t tackled from the pulpit, it is to be tackled from the nation's bully pulpit. Uh, so that has not been done enough, I fear, in our country. Um, there's something else about India, which is, and is perhaps true for other parts of the world also. We have so many groups, 
If you, you know, some of you have heard of the caste system and you've heard of the fourfold division. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but there are a few thousand divisions in Indian society. Uh, and it's very easy to find another group to blame for whatever may be deficient in, in your area. And as a student of history and a student of the world, I found this, and this is true of, in, uh, it, it's well known, or rather it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an obvious truth, but in, in, in this case, this is a truth, an obvious truth, confirmed through painstaking research, which is this. We Indians have opinions about our neighbors, but we don't have knowledge about our neighbors. Uh, we don't take time to listen to them. We don't know our neighbors. And what you said in a, your conversation with the maintenance person, go to the Canadian people. Uh, so we Indians have to, to go to one another, to, to listen to one another. And one piece of work that, in which I've been engaged also for 50 or 60 years, in addition to speaking truth to whoever is willing to listen through my writing, uh, my friends and I, about 55 years ago, we created a center uh, in Western India, in the hills of Western India, where we encourage listening to each other. Conscience, on conscience. Uh, and together seeking some reconciliation, if possible. So, uh, and, and we are not the only people doing this. There's so many other people under different umbrellas, different names, different titles, are doing this kind of work. So, some very wonderful things are happening in India, and some wonderful, positive things are also happening in India. So one last uh, question or round of questions, and I know that uh, what I'm asking now, you've all touched on it in, in, in some way, and so feel free to uh, respond to it in whatever way you deem appropriate. The main question I'm putting now is, um, at a time uh, that uh, democracies are themselves uh, beset uh, by so many burdens, whether we have a, a liberal uh, populism, let alone the resurgent global authoritarianism, uh, let alone uh, patterns of uh, xenophobia and the like. What are the lessons to be learned from your nonviolent struggle to meet uh, the challenges that democracies are facing today, which includes also the very loss of belief in the importance of democracy, in the values of democracy, in the institutions of democracy, particularly among younger people um, who never experienced maybe the totalitarianisms of the past, yet have increasing skepticism about the democracies of the present. Cindy? We have a paradox in that we have an interconnected world thanks to social media and Google than we've ever had in our lifetime. And yet I think our own worlds have become smaller when it comes to the compassion that we exercise for those around us. It is a paradox that only can be reversed in my view by raising a new generation of children. And that means that we don't just focus on youth engagement. In some ways, that's too late. That we build a foundation of loving and peaceful civic action in every child from the earliest age, and we mentor that along. There has never been a generation, in my view, that needs to be so prepared to tackle the difficult and sometimes the hatred uh, from around the world, from our different members of our community, as well as in our political leaders as the one right now. And we can't wait until they're 20 and 25 and voting in order to instill those messages. Our real opportunity here is to reduce the number of bystanders in society. Reduce the number of people who gate themselves in and say that I'm not smart enough to be a part of this movement. I don't know enough to be a part of this movement. Someone else will do it. I say that as a position person who has some authority because that was exactly what I did for many years. 
We must overcome our own insecurities and demonstrate that love in an action of justice for our fellow human beings, and we must teach our kids to grow up and get into lots of trouble for doing the right thing. Do Yes, in, uh, I think in the South African situation, uh, we have a whole generation, what we call, I don't know, loosely born free. Uh, the young, the youth who, have, who, who are not part of the struggle, some of them don't, don't even understand what apartheid was like, you see. And, uh, and, uh, whether they pose a threat to democracy, I'm not sure, because I think it's a responsibility of the uh, of people from of our generation to 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 guide them, uh, uh, to tell them exactly, you know, this democracy was won by 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 blood and tears. It didn't just come from heaven, and I think that there's a lot of youth activities that we are now involved in. Uh, uh, for the young people to understand uh, where we come from and, and what is the meaning of democracy and how, why is it that, uh, that we need a, it is the, a democratic South Africa that will secure the future and not some type of an authoritarian or, or a dictatorship. I think that, uh, you see, one point I'd like to make is that engaging in nonviolent struggle does begin to shape your political thinking and your political philosophy. In 1946, we had this passive resistance campaign, 8,000 people, 2,000 went to jail, 1952, 8,000 people went to jail. When I was on Robben Island and Mandela was in Victor Foster prison, and in 1989, uh, he would call some of us to tell us exactly, look, this is what he's doing because he's negotiating with the apartheid government, you see. And one thing struck me, he says, you know, we want majority rule. There is no compromise. But we must address the fears and the concerns of the white minority. Two things had to go together. Of course, he'll want us to go and talk to the other prisoners. He was consulting, but even after his release. And if you look at the, 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 the philosophy of, 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 of his nonviolent struggle, the whole nonviolent struggle of, of the many years, I think it shaped his thinking that we want a society where there is no hatred, there is no revenge. That is why the South African had, uh, he had, of course, had this what is Truth and Reconciliation Commission, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to defeat hatred and to bring about a, a, a non-racial society. And it is the task for us to, 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 to see that the young people who are coming forward also begin to, 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 uh, to understand and then by the whole question of non-racialism and, and, and a non-sexist society. Uh, Mr. Ibrahim's mention of uh, or reg recalling Nelson Mandela reminds me of conversation that Mandela had with India. Uh, this must have been nine, 1990. Uh, this is before the changes came place, but after his release. One of the first countries he visited was India. And uh, India's president at the time, Mr. Venkat Raman, said to Mr. Mandela, at the end of their conversation, I will be praying for you. Mandela said, thank you very much, but please also pray for Mr. de Klerk, the white president of South Africa. So this is to show 
to confirm exactly that he wanted also to understand the apprehensions of the minority groups. Now, what lessons have we learned? Uh, as a historian, one lesson I have learned is that the worst of situations, the, the most terrible of situations, ultimately does come to an end. Now, sometimes it takes a very long time. But so far, history has shown that some horrible eras have ended. So one thing I always say to myself if I find a particular situation very troublesome, one day less now, every morning when I get up. It's one day less. <laughs> I say that with Trump in office every single day. <laughs> um, um. Another thing I say when activists of all kinds who are very keen on some kind of change, they are impatient, they're disappointed, setbacks. One thing I say to them is, let's at least be a little nicer to one another here. Because so many of us who have great aims and are working also sometimes have, you know, difficult colleagues, we rub one another the wrong way. I think a very major lesson for all of us to learn is to be a little nicer to one another in our, in, in, in our team. Um, and then I would just go back to the, uh, to the first about everything, every dark period does have an end. That Ultimately, love, compassion, kindness, mutual concern. We know this from, from our family, from our children, from our neighbors, that these positive forces are stronger than hatred and anger. So with that complete confidence, we should move forward. I want to thank our panelists uh, for their really exemplary presentations. And now we'll uh, entertain questions from, from the audience. You can put questions to um, any one of our panelists or to all of them together. Uh, to all the panelists together. Democracy requires the constant and full participation of citizens. And I will define to you what I mean by a citizen. A citizen is not simply one who swears allegiance to the Queen, Her Majesty the Queen, and abides by the laws of the country. This is just the tip of the iceberg. It goes much, much deeper than that. It must come to the point where that individual internally and willingly takes the stand to be fully responsible for everyone and everything that happens in that community, that person becomes a citizen. The reason why we have the divisions that we have now is we don't understand what citizenship means. We only understand that I should abide by the laws and take from the government whatever I can get. That doesn't define me as a citizen. And I would like you to, to really pause and think about that. It's no good saying there shouldn't be any hatred between people. People hate each other because they don't take care of each other. If we were to take care of each other fully, we will not need laws and law enforcement. And the way to do it, unfortunately, our rulers are not allowing us to become citizens. They want to keep us as subjects. The way to become a citizen is to give that individual the responsibility to care for others. And by that I mean, when I am paying income tax, and when you are paying income tax, you should have the choice to channel your portion of the income taxes into the programs that you think are best going to serve your neighbor, your city, your province, and your country. Thank you. Turn it over uh, to the panel. We'll maintain the sequence which has worked so effectively, and we'll start with you, Cindy. Boy, uh, first of all, I don't think being a Canadian uh, or being a member of this society means swearing allegiance to the Queen. Uh, that is the whole fabric of colonialism. Um, I think it is in your character. I think it is in the way that you embody 
the values that we say that we share with one another, not only in this country or in this province or in this city, but indeed as a human community that is bounded with the, uh, in interdependence with the one mother we all share, which is the earth. When we do more than say those values or sing them in a national anthem, but we actually compel ourselves to act on those values to the best that we can with one another and even more for the people that we will never know, that we'll never know, we'll never know and the generations that we will never know, that we realize that we owe the generations that we never know a duty, then I think we become something close to what you would think is a citizen. But it is not in swearing allegiance to the queen or any country. Those are fragile existences. Our pledge needs to be to our shared humanity. Uh, <clears throat> What is important about South Africa is that uh, that uh, we treat all citizens equally. Uh, we give uh, equal status to all religion, for instance. Uh, when the president is inaugurated, uh, of course the majority of the people are, are Christians, over 80% or more. We have a Christian prayer, we have a Hindu prayer. We have a Muslim prayer, we had a Jewish prayer, and even an African uh, traditional prayer. So we want to recognize uh, 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 all religion, give equality, equality to all language. Uh, our constitution is very strong on this question of, of, of cultural rights. Everyone has a right to, to, to practice their own culture. The other day I was uh, sitting with uh, a Saudi Arabian. He was from, the, was from the royal family, having coffee with him. And, uh, well, I didn't notice, but he noticed a, a Muslim woman covered, veil covered, you know, on the face. And he says to me, and this woman walks past, nobody even gives a second glance. Nobody even cares, you know, that, 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 that you, you know, we have, Freedom of religion in, in, in South Africa, people can practice, the Muslim can practice their own religious uh, uh, events, and the Hindus do the same, etc., etc. So you've got to build a, 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 that loyalty to South Africa, loyalty to one country, and not uh, you know, having loyalty to someone else. But you could do that if you treat all citizens as equal citizens of South Africa and have all the rights of everyone else in South Africa would have, yeah? Thank you. Uh, I, I would like just to return to my first thought about Canada because our friend spoke about what citizenship can mean, if properly understood. Um, I, I, st I just am, as I again contemplate the incredible richness, the presence of all the races of the world here in Canada, uh, living in diversity, equality, freedom. I'm so glad that Dr. Blackstock reminded us of planet Earth our mother, our father, our common parent. Uh, I, I, I just uh, look forward to the increasing, constructive, wonderful role that the people of Canada will play in the story of our world. Yes, next question. Mr. Moderator. My name is Lloyd Stanford, and I have uh, the privilege and the honor of uh, participating um, 25 years ago in a similar session, but um, one not as exalted as this in the sense that um, I don't think at that, on that occasion um, 
the, the Indian diaspora had the privilege of um, distinguished visitors uh, as we have um, this evening and persons with that intimate association uh, with Mahatma Gandhi. Um, I, I should say very quickly that um, I was participating in a modest way as, um, and this will upset uh, Ms. Blackstock, but uh, I was then the outgoing president of the Royal Commonwealth Society, uh, Ottawa branch, Royal Commonwealth Society. So <laughs> um, the reference to the Queen and so on is um, not something on which one wants to dwell in terms of the Queen in Canada, but you are, of course, very aware of the particular relationship that uh, Indigenous peoples have in Canada with the crown. Let's not say the queen, but with the crown. And that is something that I know you are able to use at the right moment in the right circumstances. Um, the thing that um, strikes me as I listen to uh, all that has been said is the fact that um, Mahatma Gandhi struck me as a boy as a person of, of action. Uh, I was um, a teenager, uh, you know, when, when he passed away. But I think um, uh, the extraordinary thing I found in, in reading uh, Gandhi's own uh, writing about himself, um, and now listening uh, to both Professor Gandhi and, of course, Mr. Ibrahim um, uh, in those, uh, those intimate glances, especially the work in South Africa, is that he was really a person of, of action in that setting. And so while we are focused on fundamental philosophy, um, I would say, some maxims of action, and I've heard all the exhortations. Um, I'm not getting a keen sense of how one moves from the, the sort of theoretical uh, dimensions of what is supposed to constitute a democratic society, a democratic government, to uh, the matter of, of urgency of the, the uh, there's a reference to, to the, the youngsters and the fact that you will then, uh, you know, have this situation in which you learn from them and, and they come up and then they will replace. My concern is about those who are now um, in their late teens or indeed in the, let's say that they're under 40 and they, are, generally speaking, we have found, they are indifferent um, to a lot of what is taking place. I mean, the, the, the metaphor for all this is right here this evening, as you said, the students aren't here. What we find in various uh, entities in which we are engaged is that the youth are generally just skeptical about democratic institutions or the whole functioning of government, or they're indifferent. Or, um, unlike the uh, modest ones to which you refer, they actually think that they know, it, they know better. So there, there, is, uh, there is, in fact, an element of arrogance that uh, one encounters in a lot of the youngsters. On the other hand, there, there is that skepticism. But in particular, especially since flagged, uh, we have the situation where you have in the population, as I understand it, the largest percentage of a particular group in the country that is under 20, I think, is in fact 
in the Aboriginal community. So what does one do about this? How does one engage them uh, and get some, something to happen within the decade? Because not everybody has the long time. At, uh, coming up to 86, I have this sense of urgency about seeing things happen. Uh, the young people who are unemployed, and there are so many of them in the three jurisdictions we're talking about, um, I think we have to come up with some pretty pragmatic and specific uh, kind of truths to tell them. So the organizing principles, the fundamental maxims, a lot of which can come from the various religions that we know, are one thing. The next thing is, I mean, what, what do we do now to put um, some flesh and some meat on the bone, the bones of these democratic principles you're talking about? Well, that's one of the reasons we have the litigation going. But there are other things that, and I think that it's not about coming up with solutions at all. It's about implementing the solutions that are already on the books. And one of the things that we have to put at the core of this whole undertaking is the elimination of the Indian Act. We, the Canada is the only Western democracy that I know of that has a racialized act that um, decides who is and who is not a registered Indian and puts people on reserves. The Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples provided a pathway out of that in 1996. It was never implemented. So something you can do is write to your member of parliament and say the time is now, not tomorrow, not the next day, the solution is there. The other thing is you go onto our website, you'll find seven free ways that you can make a difference in under two minutes. It doesn't take any time. It's fncaringsociety.com. And uh, the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal is hearing more of the case tomorrow. So we'll see you in the courtroom. <laughs> We're, we're going to take uh, two more questions. I'll ask the uh, questions if they can to uh, please be brief. We'll take them uh, both at the same time, and then we'll have our panelists respond. And I'll try to be as brief as possible. I wanted to address my concerns to everyone. Dr. Blackstock, you had into, when I listen to this concept of unceded territory, and that this university, this synagogue, this church, what does it mean? I haven't heard of anything as patronizing is that, what is the university actually doing? Is it ceding some of its tax, uh, some of its contributions? Is it, are you getting the Aboriginal communities? Are they getting anything from that? Government institutions that are on uh, unceded Indian land? I mean, it's, it's horrible. Uh, next, I'd like to address the High Commissioner of India, who says that India is a beacon of democracy. And, and uh, Dr. Uh, Gandhi, I have to give you a lot of credit for putting out a lot of honesty. Uh, in clearing the table of some concepts that are unreal and untrue. There's so much poverty in India. There is the caste system. Women are disenfranchised. They're treated as second-class citizens. Things are improving, no doubt, but still. Uh, I mean, the pollution, the, the, there's so much that is wrong in India and has, the corruption. I wonder if Mahatma Gandhi was alive today. What would he have thought of? There's been great strides in technology, in medicine, in space, a lot of things that India can take a lot of pride in. But when it comes to its poorest, the, the people that need to be uplifted, how fast? Things haven't gotten very far. And uh, for uh, Mr. Ibrahim, Ibrahim, when you speak about South Africa, uh, and uh, now it's Cyril Ramaphosa, who's the, uh, who's the new leader, um, and you're mentioning um, um, Nelson Mandela and his concern about the white community and about fairness and prayer for uh, uh, the former prime minister, de Klerk. The land, the expropriation of land for the white, uh, white settlers, white communities. Uh, uh, it's one thing, uh, the, uh, you know, the appropriation of land, but they're not going to be paid. It'll be forced appropriation of land. So I wonder how Nelson Mandela, and again, you also have the underclass. Uh, there are still the slums uh, in uh, Bantustan slums, whatever in in South Africa. Would Nelson Mandela, if he could look, if he was alive today, would he have said the things have improved to the point where he would take a lot of pride in? 
And this isn't discounting the positives that have taken place in South Africa, there's no doubt, but the ANC seems to be elected one year after another. You've had Jacob Zuma, who was a master of corruption. So again, you know, these are issues that I wonder how your, uh, Nelson Mandela would have looked upon it and what he would have said. Thanks. I'll take a second question, and then we'll have our panelists respond to both of them. A uh, very short question. A uh, lot of people make, uh, compare situation in the United States now with what's happening in India, uh, and there are similarities. But there's one thing one notices, that whereas in the United States, the institutions have stood up to the power that be and um, have confronted wherever they thought that some wrong was going on, it seems that in India, the institutions have not proven that strong. They seem to be compromising. And this is happening the second time. It happened during emergency, during Indira Gandhi's time also, and it's happening now too. Oh, what do you think needs, to, uh, can be done to make the institutions in India stronger? And a very brief question, secondly, what happened to Himmat? Thank you for your question. And, and since both of those questions uh, address the issues in uh, India, Rajaman, I'll ask you to begin first on, with this group of questions. So uh, although the High Commissioner was also addressed by the questioner, I don't know whether they, so, uh, but, uh, you know, you're absolutely right. I, I, I can't speak about on the Canadian situation, uh, not on the South African either. But if you say that India has so many very serious shortcomings and weaknesses and painful, glaring weaknesses, I would only agree totally. And I'm absolutely flattered to think that you thought that our conversation today would lead to an immediate plan of action of how to improve matters. So thank you for, for, for the expectation that you have from, <laughs> from all of us. Uh, but I, I thank you also for underlining the gravity of the situation. On your question about, uh, you're quite right about the institutions in India not um, standing up. Uh, absolutely right. Uh, but again, here and there, you find individuals in this institution or that, whether it's the media or the judiciary or the bureaucracy or some investigating agency or a prosecuting agency, agencies that should be autonomous, that should be independent, that should be courageous, uh, that should not worry about what the government of the day may think or not think, but go absolutely after the fact, subjectively. Uh, there are cases of individuals manning or womaning these agencies who do some great things. But by and large, your, your, your assessment is absolutely, sadly valid. Uh, I don't know how to propose a solution for it, except to say that very often an individual can revise or reverse or improve the trajectory of an institution. Uh, and, but beyond that, I, 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 I don't feel I'm competent to make recommendations of how to achieve dramatic and, and speedy changes in institutions. But thank you for making this very important point about the failure of it. And, and, and another aspect of your question or your comment is this, that an attack on institutions and autonomous institutions is another very important and troubling feature of, of today's, today's India. Uh, as for what happened to Himmat, well, sadly, for financial reasons, Himmat only survived from, this is a weekly journal. I'm very glad that you remind me of that. Uh, it was started in 64. It was suspended in 81. But there is now a very small, very humble Himmat website. So you are most welcome to go to himmat.net, H-I-M-M-A-T dot net. If I can sum it up, and pardon me for summing it up crudely, is what might uh, Nelson Mandela think about the problems uh, that are burdening uh, South Africa today, be it uh, issues of 
uh, corruption or uh, inequality uh, and the like, and how does one address those? <coughs> yeah, of course, uh, we are a democratic state with very, very strong institutions. And uh, we have had problems, we had allegations of corruption. The fact that our institutions or our civil society were able to, to, to expose this corruption, the media as well, which I think is, is a plus for our democracy. Uh, there is a commission of inquiry appointed by the president, presided by the deputy chief justice. And uh, that inquiry is now unearthing the type of corruption that took place in government. And, and I think that uh, the fact that we have a commission of inquiry, the fact that, uh, that our institutions are so strong that we're able to, to, to expose this corruption, I think it's, 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 it's a plus for our, our democracy. And once the commission is over, the law enforcement agency will take its course. You see? And I'm quite confident that we will be able to deal uh, uh, with all these allegations of corruption uh, that, has, uh, that has surfaced. Uh, I must admit that, uh, that it has uh, shown some concern, uh, and which has slightly reflected in, in the recent election as well. And, uh, and the question of, uh, of course, economically, uh, we have had economic problems. Uh, we were doing very well economically until the, uh, the financial crisis that hit us. And uh, we have 27% unemployment. And uh, we have a lot of server delivery protests. There's protests every other day. Well, that's also a sign of a mature democracy. Uh, people are allowed to protest. At times, protests become a bit violent, but the law enforcement agency takes care of it. Uh, we are confident that uh, with the new president that we have, and after the election that has just taken place with the new government, that all prospect that our economy is going to improve and deal with some of the challenges of inequality. You're right, there's a tremendous amount of inequality in our country. Some comes because there's a leftover of the apartheid system, but it's something that, uh, that, that, the, that the current government is aware of and taking steps to deal with it, yeah. And of course, uh, our new president has been uh, uh, engaging the business community both domestic and international business community. And they have been waiting for the election, and they have said to us that, uh, that once the elections are over, once they have certainty about the policies, then uh, they are prepared to come and invest and create the necessary jobs in our country. Thank you. Cindy? All, since uh, this will be my last time at the mic, I want to just say what a privilege it's been to spend the evening with these three gentlemen and with all of you. So thank you very, very much for that honor. I, uh, for the, the person who asked what you can do, I understand the urgency so much because I see children every day suffer. Another reminder that we all have a shared responsibility to implement the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action. There are 94 ways each one of us could, could even just take one and focus on that. Imagine the difference this uh, we could make to the country in just one year. As far as the recognition of unceded Algonquin territory, I look at that as a recognition of the ongoing injustice and outstanding land um, issues that need to be resolved with the Algonquin people. It is a reminder that that is still there. It's not enough just to say it. 
we have to then translate it into action so that we can, uh, you know, ask, actually demand of our elected officials that they implement the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in Canada, it's codified as law, and that the outstanding issues like the, the land claims of the Algonquin people and many others across this country, the Métis and Inuit as well, that those rights are recognized. Natan Obed, the president of the ITK, was on a panel with me, and I just think that the man is brilliant. And he once said, um, part of what we need to do is we have to stop thinking about the provision of basic human rights to Indigenous peoples as reconciliation. That is not reconciliation. That is the foundation upon which we build reconciliation. Until we have justice and equity, in this society that respects the distinct cultures and traditions and rich heritages of indigenous peoples, we will not be able to become the country of our ancestors' dream and our children's wishes. We have to implement this in this country. It cannot just remain a hollow gesture or international tool. We can be better than that. We just got to show the kids that we're worthy of their future, of being custodians of it. I, I've been advised that there's uh, one other question uh, to be asked, and so I'll, I'll ask that question to be put. Uh, thank you so much to all the speakers and for taking the time to speak to us. It's truly an honor to hear from each of you. Um, so, as a representative of the youth community, <laughs> um, perhaps it's a little hard, harsh to say that there is no engagement. I do understand that there is a, a great deal of disengagement, um, but it does seem like there, there is a growing number of youth that are very dedicated and wanting to do changes. They may just not have direction on where to go. Um, and just in the, like the, the past elections, within the last few years, just a noticing of um, disenfranchisement uh, towards democracy, that uh, people lacking faith in capitalism, um, and there's like an anti-globalism um, feeling happening on both uh, the, the far left and the far right. Um, uh, so my question would be, on the topic of democracy um, and youth wanting to be engaged, um, is there a, is there a way that um, youth can engage uh, and also p disenfranchise people in general, uh, including adults uh, who, who have been through, like may have lost their desire to contribute? Is there a way for them to direct their focus in pushing democracy to involve in a way that they feel def um, represented and that they feel like their issues are being addressed? Um, thank you so much and thank you for the uh, the examples, uh, Cindy, um, like it, I, I find that's very helpful. Thank you. Okay, uh, this is the uh, final question, and therefore we're delighted, Cindy, that you have and the other panelists a chance to uh, respond uh, once again. And so I'll start with you, Cindy, to that question. That Socrates, who was lamenting about the generation of his of youth and that that the, the world was was going down the tubes, right? They weren't getting involved. I actually have found I've been so inspired to find young people all over the country of every diversity and indeed around the world who are real champions and activists. I just think of Greta Thunberg, the environmental activist, the March for Our Lives, the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit youth, and their allies in this country that are standing up for justice. Um, there are so many examples of where we need to support these people. I think it's too easy of an answer for us to say that they're disengaged. I think what we need to do is hand them the microphone and provide them with the support. And as adults, we need to set the right example. There is a great Russian saying that children will never always listen to their elders, but they'll never fail to imitate them. And so um, I think there's a bunch of them that are imitating many of us who are just sitting down and saying nothing. And then there's others who are inspired by great examples like these gentlemen and yourself and uh, Mahatma Gandhi and Nelson Mandela and others, and they're doing something. They're making a better world for all of us. Well, I didn't <coughs> really yet get the question properly, but uh, uh, you see, the, 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 
the success of democracy would depend much on on the civil society, the strength and the organization of civil society. And I think that without a very strong, powerful civil society, I don't think that democracy would uh, would uh, would, uh, would go very far, would be very successful. I think what we need is a very strong civil society, which means that we need very strong women's organization, we need very strong women's organization, and uh, and and we need uh, you know human rights organizations in south africa of course we've got uh, a strong human rights culture there we got human rights uh, uh, we got human rights commission we got a public protector but above all i think it's very important for us to have a very very strong civil society i i in india when i watch some of the indian news i was very much bit impressed with the civil society there, the, the debate that takes place. I only watch one TV in any case, in the TV, but I get very much, I'm very impressed the manner in which the, the Indian civil society begins to address and uh, not afraid to criticize uh, uh, the government when they feel the government is wrong. Thank you. Um. <clears throat> Mr. Ibrahim refers to debates on Indian television. I'm very impressed that he's able to follow those debates because those pa who participate in the debates are speaking simultaneously. So I, I, I respect his great skill in comprehending these debates. Um, well, as a your question was asked about the youth, was, am I right? In, was it about the youth? Well, as a young man of 84, uh, I agree that we youth have a great responsibility and a great future. Uh, all I would say is that in this age of discouragement and in so much noise from all quarters, so much action, all that's needed is for us to really follow our convictions to identify our convictions, separate our real convictions from activity or this desire or that desire. But if there is a deep, deep urge of some kind, follow it. Find a team, teammate. Because you can't do anything useful really on your own. But identify your deepest urge, find a teammate, do a small thing well, and it'll grow and grow and grow. I'd like now on, uh, on your behalf, on our collective behalf, to thank our uh, panel of nonviolent warriors uh, for uh, democracy and democratic change. Uh, each of you have been inspired uh, by the philosophy of Mahatma Gandhi. It has been a shared uh, connection uh, with our panelists and indeed with the audience this evening. And uh, each of you, have shared with us what a commitment to our common humanity is all about. So thank you for this, and it's been a pleasure to share the platform uh, with people who really are the personifications of courage. Thank you. Okay, folks, this is, uh, I hope you feel, I'm sure you feel like I felt, like this was just an incredible lesson. And it's like Mr. Kotler said, uh, we got inspired by these very young people uh, at the front of this stage. And thank you for sharing your experiences and your wisdom. Just again, thank you all for coming. And thank you, High Commissioner. Thank you, our friends from the South African Embassy. Thank you, our, our colleagues that we shared with tonight with the Society for Mahatma Gandhi here in Ottawa. Uh, Ivo Javad, which is a student-led, this is why we're here today, it's, it's, it's organized by the students. Thank you, CPAC. We have, outside the room, we have some uh, refre refreshments. So thank you for coming. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, CPAC.